All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. I mean, it's terrific to have you here, uh, both in person and for the larger number of people who are watching online through the live stream or watching this recorded sometime after the fact. We're glad in whatever way you're taking advantage of the event. Uh, my name is Barry Burden, and I am Professor of Political Science and Director of the Elections Research Center here at UW-Madison. And this is a panel on the road to the 2024 Republican nomination for president. Uh, we're going to try to understand today what will happen on the path to the Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee next July, when the Republican Party chooses its nominee to run against presumably Joe Biden in November. Uh, I want to highlight an event coming up next month that might interest you as well. On October 13th, in the same room at 3 p.m., we'll have an event on voting rights and the criminal justice system. So questions about what states are doing on voting rights for people who are incarcerated or those probation or parole uh, or who have fin finished their sentences. States, as you know, are doing a lot of different things there. And so we're going to have a conversation about the legal, moral, practical, and other issues involved. Um, so feel free to visit the Elections Research Center or the State Democracy Research Initiative website to register for that event. We are co-sponsoring it. Again, that's October 13th. Uh, I also want to thank Jess Esplin, who's the assistant working at the Elections Research Center for making this all possible. It's more complex than you would uh, imagine, uh, but here we all are. So thank you, Jess, for making it work. So let me say a few things about the 2024 GOP nomination from my perspective, and then I want to turn it over to this amazing group who I'll introduce. Um, in some ways, this is a totally normal nomination season for the out party, the one that's hoping to take back the White House. There's a field of candidates. There are about 10 of them. That's a normal number. It's not the 20 that, or so that the Democrats had in the last cycle or the 17 that the Republicans had back in 2016. It's a mix of people who you would think would be credible candidates for president. There are some governors and former governors, a senator, a former vice president, uh, some business folks, and one former president and two-time nominee. Uh, the calendar and the rules, I think, as Josh will say, have not changed a lot on the Republican side. So it's sort of an orderly process. We know what's involved, in, at least in terms of what states are first and which are last and roughly what the delegate rules are. And we're doing all the normal things that happen during a nomination process. The first debate took place last month in Milwaukee. The next debate will take place in a couple of weeks in California. The Republicans have sort of locked down monthly debates. There are also other forums. There's fundraising happening and fundraising deadlines and endorsements and just all the hoopla that usually surrounds a presidential nomination. Um, yet, it's also totally bizarre, totally bizarre. The leader on the Republican side is a former president of the United States who lost the popular vote two times and the Electoral College once, was impeached twice, is believed by his own party to have cost his party votes in the 2018 midterms, especially, but also probably in the 2022 midterms as well, has been indicted in multiple courts in multiple states for multiple cases and reasons, uh, which could lead to trials during the nomination campaign and maybe convictions before election day, or at least an outcome in one or more cases. It's also strange because it's likely to be a rematch in the general election of Biden and Trump and we know what happened in that contest. Biden won the popular vote by about four and a half points, won the Electoral College by 74 electoral votes. So there's a thinking going on on the Republican side that that won't happen again. Why would you nominate someone uh, to produce the same result? Uh, it's also strange in that the likely Republican nominee will be about 80 years old if he were to take office. And yet one of the top criticisms of the current incumbent is he is too old to do the job. So the party may be sacrificing an advantage in terms of the comparison of the ages of the candidates. And also parties typically walk away from losers, from candidates who fail in the general election and sometimes those who fail at the nomination. There was no chance that the Republicans would renominate John McCain after he lost in 2008. I think no chance that Mitt Romney would be the nominee after 2012. And you could say the same thing for a number of democratic contest, often those losers are persona non grata in the party, or at least not le considered leaders in the direction of the party. But that's exactly the opposite of what's happening this year, where the losing candidate is still the party, essentially. There's not much left um, once he's taken out of it. Uh, Biden is, I'm uh, sorry, not, well, Biden is also in the lead on his side, but on the Republican side, Trump is 
a, a durable dominant leader. He is ahead in the polls by 30 or 40 or 50 points, depending on the state and the time the poll is done. But he's also leading in early states. It's not just national recognition or familiarity. And it's not just polling. He's leading in fundraising and endorsements and other things that are typical hallmarks of the winners of these nominations. Um, the party, another thing strange this year is I think the party is looking for a message, the one that will work for them in November. Uh, there have been messages against the Biden regime, both in the midterms and in 2020, that are going to be resuscitated to some degree this year. The concerns about inflation, crime, and the border, uh, and those things may be linked in some ways, um, but, but none of them were particularly effective in the midterms. So there's a question of whether the party thinks that will have more bite this time around, or there's some other thing that will work for them in taking out Biden. There's also sort of a dilemma around the abortion issue. The, the party has mostly gotten what it's wanted since Roe v. Wade, but I think we saw in the debate in Milwaukee a few weeks back that there are differences among leaders in the party about how to handle that issue and what they think the party ought to do. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel about where Republicans go. Is it immigration or identity politics or gender or the drug problem or what, what's happening in cities or something else uh, that becomes the issue? Or is it the impeachment of Joe Biden and his family connections to Hunter and potential corruption or something else that becomes the issue? Uh, one other thing that's sort of a strange sidelight this year is there are Republican candidates who are not named Trump who are raising money in strange ways to get on debate stages, ways that actually make money for the people making donations to them. A couple of candidates have offered essentially cash back for making even $1 donations to them. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy is allowing people to keep 10% of what they raise for his campaign if they do it in particular ways. So that's, I have not seen that before in the same way, uh, but it seems to be working for them at least in the short run. Uh, there are also two candidates in the mix who seem to be running mostly to take down the party or the leader of the party, Chris Christie being the loudest voice there. It look, doesn't look to me like he's running to be the nominee. He's running to stop one other person from being the nominee or being the general election winner. Uh, now, maybe all of this will reshuffle when we get closer to Iowa and New Hampshire. That often happens. Polling in particular often looks quite stable until you get just in that period where candidates get a little desperate and the votes start being cast. Uh, but at the moment, it's hard to see how Trump is dislodged from any of this. OK, so those are some opening thoughts. Let me introduce our panel, and then we're going to hear from people who actually know what's happening. Uh, so let me talk about all four of them, and then we'll turn over to them for comments. Uh, first is Julia Azari, who's second in line here, a professor of political science just down the road at Marquette University. Julia is an expert in American politics, especially the politics of the presidency and political parties. She's the co-host of the podcast, Politics in Question. Check it out on your favorite podcast app. She's the author of a number of publications, including the book, Delivering the People's Message, The Changing Politics of the Presidential Mandate. She's a frequent contributor to public outlets such as 538 and recently a Politico piece on the vice president. She earned her PhD from Yale in political science in 2007. Uh, also on our dais is Reed Epstein. Uh, Reed covers campaigns and elections for the New York Times. He's been a reporter there since 2019. He is covering both sides of the aisle now, uh, both what's happening in the Biden campaign and the Republicans uh, from his base in Washington, D.C. He has followed previous presidential campaigns, including nomination campaigns of uh, Mitt Romney and Ben Carson and others. Before joining the Times, he was with the Wall Street Journal, Politico, and our own Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. So welcome back, Reed. Uh, and Reed just had a piece, I think it was last week, on the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the impeachment discussion that's happening here, and a piece just before that about Biden's age and the struggles of the Biden campaign around that. So uh, glad to have you here. Uh, also with us is Liz Mayer. Liz is the founder and president of Mayer Strategies. Uh, I don't know that I could summarize your background easily. It's interesting and complicated. Uh, you spend a fair amount of time as a lawyer on both sides of the Atlantic. In no, the actually, only in England. Only in England as a lawyer. <laughs> so operating in the legal community in the UK, but found her way into Republican politics in the United States as a consultant. Uh, was the online communications director for the Republican National Committee in the 2008 campaign and was a spokesperson for the RNC and the McCain campaign uh, representative on behalf of the campaign that year. 
Uh, she's been a commentator in many print and TV outlets from Bill Maher to CNN to uh, lots of others where you may have seen her and has been involved behind the scenes in the campaigns of people, including Rick Perry, Carly Fiorina, Rand Paul, and our own Scott Walker. So welcome back to Wisconsin also to Liz. Uh, and finally, Josh Putnam, uh, here closest to me. Josh is trained as a political scientist, has his PhD from the University of Georgia. He is the creator of Front Loading HQ. Front Loading HQ is an essential source for anyone who wants to understand what is happening with primaries and caucuses and delegates and conventions. He is the founder of FHQ Strategies and has been and is still a consultant on delegate selection and other election strategies for both candidates, campaigns, and media outlets. He's collaborated with media on these issues, uh, including sites like Vox and 538 on delegate projections, uh, and I think probably knows more than anybody on the planet <laughs> about how delegates will be selected this next year. Uh, so we're going to hear from each panelist. They each take about 10 minutes to offer their perspective on things. We'll then open it up to Q&A. If you're in the room, there are index cards on the table, and you should write down your questions as they come to you. We'll collect them, and I'll pose those questions to the panel. If you're online watching us on Zoom, you should submit your question using the Q&A function on Zoom. Nothing else, not the chat, nowhere else, just in the Q&A. We'll find your question there and I will draw on both the online questions and the in the room questions for our group. Um, so with that, let's go back to the order in which I introduced folks and Julia Azari, you are first. And if you could just pull the mic in front of you to make sure we catch it online. Sure, um, you switched it on. Okay, great, uh, thank you. So I've been thinking a lot about where we're at in this moment in the race compared with past races and I, I looked back at at uh, 2007 and found some kind of striking similarities there where there's a clear front runner with high name recognition running at 45% and then one candidate kind of trailing that top candidate by some 20 points and a bunch of others polling around 3%. Of course, that candidate who seemed so inevitable in September of 2007 was Hillary Clinton and her, her close trailer behind her was, was Barack Obama. So on the one hand, a lot can change, but that also I think prompts us to think about what's, what's different. Um, September is often the time where there's some kind of churn in the race. And looking back on 2012, this was a period where, um, where Mitt Romney was the front runner, but some of the other candidates, Herman Cain, started to catch up on him. Um, so the fact that Trump is actually relatively much more ahead than some of these recent past candidates is, is fairly indicative. And it makes us, I think, sort of tempted to end the story there. I think the framework that I've been dealing with and thinking about and writing about over the last couple of years is this question of, is it Trump's party? Is the GOP Trump's party? And I want to address that and kind of address some big picture questions about what are the kind of underlying dynamics of the GOP in this nomination season? And what is that? What does that predict for the party, really, regardless of who's nominated or who wins in November of 2024? What is it kind of going on? So I'm going to frame that in this much larger kind of party context. I'm thinking very much also like Barry, that the normal and abnormal um, coinciding has very much been the story of the of the Trump era. But I want to I want to take us back to this is it is it Trump's party? The kickoff of nomination season has offered very little to suggest otherwise. It's been very indicative I think to a lot of observers that Trump has now faced four indictments and Although it doesn't actually seem to have helped him very much, maybe a little bump after the first indictment in New York, um, it doesn't it doesn't really seem to have hurt him, at least with his own party. Um, his name recognition, and I think you cannot underestimate the um, you kind of overestimate the importance of name recognition in presidential primaries. His name recognition is very high, and he's a very dedicated following. Um, some maybe might describe even as sort of a cult of personality. Thinking about this in a more structural parties way, Trump has proven to be what, what I'd like to call a coordination point in a party that's otherwise really collapsing under its own anti-establishment weight. And I think we're seeing that once again. And the GOP has a lot of internal divides. Trump, weirdly enough, has come in to, to provide uh, a point of, of commonality. 
I think this Trump centricness was really in evidence last month in the GOP debate in Milwaukee. I wasn't in the room, but um, I watched I watched on TV. I did a live chat on Substack with another political scientist. So I watched really closely. And one thing that I think was reflected on that debate stage and among those eight non-Trump candidates who showed up is something that has defined the GOP since Trump left office in 2021. And that's why we kind of have three categories and it's like a Trump centric axis. So it's not divided on any number of these other issues, but there's a sort of clear division of Trump, you know, the kind of Trump light, the people who agree with Trump on many of the issues that kind of stopped short on January 6th. So that's a kind of Pence Haley sort of situation. The Trump plus, um, I think uh, sort of most exemplified by Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy, um, and then anti-Trump, which, uh, as Barry said, is the kind of Asa Hutchinson and Chris Christie candidates who are clearly running um, to position themselves more broadly against Trump and Trumpism. So in that sense, when everybody is kind of talking about you and positioning themselves in relation to you, you have you have already won that debate, right? Um, and so Trump, Trump wasn't on the stage, but he was very much sorting out these candidates that way. But when there are questions about Trump, when there's questions about January 6th, it was pretty clear that the candidates didn't want to sort themselves that way. And most kind of seemed to come to the stance that they agreed with what Pence had done on January 6th. They, they agreed with proceeding with the election um, as, as defined by the rules, but also that they would end endorse Trump as the nominee. They would still prefer him to to Joe Biden or, or a Democratic alternative, despite also wanting to distance themselves publicly from, from January 6th. So we kind of see this being Trump's party in, in two ways. And I've sort of defined this, and I have a piece that will come out in the next, hopefully next decade or so, um, in an edited volume on, on the Trump legacy. Um, <laughs> where I wrote about Trump's relationship with the GOP. And my argument in that is that Trump leads by dilemma, that he's at the center of the party debates. People are constantly having to respond to him. Um, he's very dominant, but they often, his fellow Republicans at the elite level often don't relish taking stances on those issues. And so he's sort of constantly putting other Republicans in positions that they don't want to be in. And although that is a certain kind of power to have over other people, it also weakens the coalition. There is some percentage of, of the coalition that when presented with that dilemma is going to opt out, is going to leave the GOP or leave the Trump coalition or, or leave politics entirely. And I think the number of candidates that appeared on the stage was a sort of testament to some of the cracks in the in the Trump dominance. And there I saw something else, something that maybe is more apparent if like me, you're you're old enough to remember when George W. Bush ran for office the first time. Um, I think it's important when you look at how, okay, I, I see this. Everyone's like, when was that? That was in 2000. Um, this is in 2000. So, okay, so this is the thing. Right. You look at a candidate like Trump, he's so, you know, he's such a large figure. He's changed the party in a lot of ways. But always look for that point of continuity. This it's always there. And I see some some ways, and I particularly saw this in that first debate, ways in which this is still George W. Bush's Republican Party. Um, part of that was the foreign policy commitments. You still you saw a real division there over how the US is going to relate specifically to, to Russia, and you still saw kind of traditional republicanism up against maybe Ramaswamy was the most vocal um, on the other side. But I also saw something that I think has kind of been um, to, to use that the kids were saying probably five or 10 years ago, uh, memory hold with, with Bush's Republican Party, which is candidates who kind of want to avoid and soften their stances on divisive social issues. This was a really important subtext in that debate. And I think it's a really important thing to keep our eye on as, as the race progresses. The moderators posed questions to the candidates about abortion. They posed a question to Nikki Haley about something she had said about um, about athletes and protecting girls' sports. And she answered, I think they're talking about reading. She, she did not want to answer that question. And this is something that also harkens back to this early 2000s GOP, to, the, to George W. Bush's party, who kind of foregrounded these social issues. But in the general election, especially the first time around, really ran more to the center and then govern to the right. And to me, it was very evident on that GOP stage that 
you had a group of candidates who were not just responding to Trump, but who were very acutely aware that somewhere out there in the audience of this debate is a general audience, is a general election audience, not just a Republican GOP audience and a Republican primary audience, and really want to distance themselves from some of the stances that have been taken in conservative leaning media at the state level in Congress and other places. And so I think that's that's a key thing to keep an eye on, even as we as we think about how Trump has, has changed the party. So ultimately what, what I'm taking away from what I've seen so far of the, the GOP race is we have a kind of two part thing going on where on the one hand it's Trump's party, but on the other hand, part of it is still George W. Bush's party. I'll end there. Thank you, Julia. On to Reed Epstein. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, this This is the, the fourth or fifth one of these presidential campaigns I've covered, uh, and it really feels like the least dramatic, sort of in the macro sense. It, the Republican primary, it very much feels like it's over. Um, you know, you, you talked about the comparisons to 2008, uh, but in this campaign, there isn't really anybody who is running uh, a serious, well-funded campaign against Donald Trump in the Republican primary. Uh, and part of the reason why that's happening or why that's not happening is that Republican voters like Donald Trump. Uh, they like what he did in office. Uh, they like his policies. They tend to like him personally. Uh, and Republican candidates have not found a whole lot of utility in attacking him. It tends to boomerang against them and and hurt their own popularity uh, with uh, you know, a couple of, of remote exceptions to that. Maybe Mitt Romney is one in, in Utah, uh, which is kind of a special case with a very specific electorate. Um, and so you have a situation in the Republican, uh, among sort of Republican Party officials and operatives, where sort of the, the party infrastructure, the gray beards, the elected officials, you know, there is probably a, a a plurality, if not a majority of them, who would like to nominate somebody other than Donald Trump, but they're crosswise with their base that is demanding Donald Trump. It's sort of the opposite of what's happening in the Democrat with Democrats, where the elite levels of the party have all, and the donors and the elected officials have all coalesced around Joe Biden, and they have an electorate that uh, isn't quite sure that he is the right guy, or, you know, there was a CNN poll last week that's a, that had two thirds of Democratic voters uh, wishing that the party would nominate someone else. And so it's it's this sort of mirror images of the parties. Uh, they have the opposite problem. One has uh, a candidate. Uh, one has the elites that are fretting about the candidate they have. And the other one has the base of the party that doesn't want the candidate that they've got. And so we are barreling toward a presidential election uh, with two deeply flawed candidates uh, with Donald Trump, uh, who has throughout this, since March, as he's been indicted four times, strengthened his hold on the Republican Party, even as he has continued to alienate the sort of voters that decide presidential elections, uh, the sort of swingy, moderate, they tend to be suburban voters, people who uh, might live in in Brookfield or Mequon, uh, in the sort of the ring inner ring outer county suburbs in Milwaukee. Those types of voters in places all over the country uh, have fled the Republican Party during the era of Trump, and there's not a great deal of evidence that they are coming back uh, for a third Trump presidential run. Now, so what that means for the next. Know, six months as the Republican primaries progress, uh, you know, we we have not, the, there's really only one well-funded Republican challenger to Trump, and it's Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, uh, whose campaign uh, has not necessarily been a textbook example of how to go about this with a large pile of money. Uh, he has made a, a series of errors that have either been of his doing or his campaign's doing or his super PAC's doing. Uh, and has really come across looking uh, like a bit of a, a bumbling candidate at this point. Um, but he's the only, you know, true obstacle to Trump at this point. Um, 
given who is in the field. And part of DeSantis's or his his biggest problem is the issues that he has centered in his campaign and sort of made the focal point of his uh, his candidacy. Donald Trump is polls better than him with Republican primary voters on every one of those issues uh, on uh, education, on sort of the wokeism, on education in schools, on social issues. Uh, DeSantis is, does not outscore Trump on any of those issues, which doesn't really leave him a whole lot to pr talk to voters about because there is no, the only real issue, uh, even on electability, which was sort of what donors talked about. If you, you know, I was at the Republican Governors Association meeting last November, talking to fellow governors who were talking up to Santos as somebody who could win the election, you know, Trump they saw as deeply flawed. Uh, but voters don't believe that. Uh, voters think that Trump is the one who has the best chance of winning. And frankly, if you talk to people on uh, Joe Biden's team, people who do polling for him, people who work on his campaign or in the White House, they will tell you too, now that Trump is the most formidable Republican candidate, whereas in the spring, DeSantis was polling better in a head-to-head -head matchup with Trump, head-to-head -head matchup with Biden than Trump was. And so there is not a whole lot of rationale at this point for any of the any of Trump's rivals in the primary, uh, either polling or with voters. Uh, you know, it's you probably can't totally count DeSantis out at this point because he does have such a large amount of money to play with. Um, but there is not much indication or he hasn't shown much indication that he's willing to basically take his hundred million dollar bazooka and turn it on Trump. Uh, and no one has done that going back to 2016 among Republicans. Uh, and so we don't know what would happen if someone made a well-funded uh, concrete case in a Republican primary against Trump. But what we what we know is that at the moment, Republican primary voters like Trump, they tend to want more of Trump and they're not discouraged by conventional wisdom that Trump's sort of legal legal problems, uh, his the way he tends to repel uh, slices, large enough slice of the Republican electorate, uh, or any of those things will cause them to lead them away from him toward, certainly not toward any of the candidates that are in the field now challenging him. Thanks, on to Liz. Okay. Do I have this close enough? I'm coming off having kind of a crappy late summer cold. So if I sound hoarse or start coughing, please forgive me. Um, I think a lot of interesting things have been said by my co-panelists so far. I'll respond to some of those um, and give some other thoughts. But one thing I want to throw out to people first to consider is we're all looking at this through the framework, assuming that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are even capable of making it to election day 2024. I don't wanna be morbid, but I'm 45 years old. Most of you are significantly younger than that. This is the highest probability I've ever seen in my life that we go into the 2024 election with actually yeah. neither of those dudes even alive, okay? So I think it's important to consider that when we're talking about how all of this may play out, because we honestly really don't know. You could end up in a situation where in a month, the legal pressure that is amassing on Donald Trump causes him to have a massive brain hemorrhage. You could end up in a situation where Joe Biden has a coronary. I am told he does a great job on his bicycling workouts. Hopefully that means he's better insulated than many Americans when it comes to that sort of health risk. But we are dealing with two really old guys who refuse to admit that they're really old guys. I guess in this interview that Trump just did, he was asked if Biden's too old to run again. And he said, no, I mean, dude, like, I don't even know what's going on there anyway. But I think there is a non-zero chance that those are not the people that we're actually going to be being asked to vote for in November. And depending on what happens between now and then and when it happens, that could affect a lot in this contest. Um, so a couple things. Um, if you are on Twitter or X or whatever the hell we're calling it these days, um, and I know many of you probably will not be, I tweeted out earlier, 
just some screenshots that I took of what was going on with the 2012 primary and polling and then delegate counts, same thing, 2016 and delegate counts. Josh is going to be the master of talking delegate counts. That is not my area of expertise. I'm the person who like anonymously attacks people on the internet. Um, but I do know enough from what I have done and doing it with little budget to try to take down Donald Trump in 2016, the delegate counts actually matter a lot and they matter a lot more than polling. Um, I think it's important to bear that in mind as we're having this discussion because personally on spec right now, I find it very hard to see how Ron DeSantis could be successful in displacing Donald Trump as the nominee short of Donald Trump, like having a coronary, which I'm Scottish, my whole family's Scottish. Once Scottish men get past the age of 40, like they're all on cholesterol medication, he is too. The chances of something happening there, again, non-zero. Um, but I do think DeSantis is probably the best place guy to take him out, all things being equal. Um, I think it's worth going and looking at what happened in 2012 and 2016, what polling looked like, the ups and the downs, uh, people who were running well ahead and were presumed to be running in positions of strength versus what actually happened on the night. Same thing 2016. I will tell you, um, certainly in the 2016 instance, Dean of Iowa polling, Ann Seltzer, said right before the Iowa caucus that Trump was going to narrowly win it, and he didn't. In fact, Ted Cruz managed to get the state of Iowa to allocate more delegates to him, the most anti-ethanol candidate in the whole history of the world, than Donald Trump was able to pull. So some pretty strange things can happen in these contests. There's a lot of unpredictability and a lot of uncertainty. And with that, a couple of things I just want to throw out here. I know I'm not not doing this in a particularly organized fashion. I do better with Q&A than I do with prepared remarks or not prepared remarks as the case may be. Um, Ann Seltzer did a poll pre-debate among likely GOP caucus goers in Iowa. And if you look at that carefully, you will see that Ron DeSantis and Trump have basically the same favorability numbers. They have pretty much the same unfavorability numbers. Trump's are a little bit higher. I'm very curious to know who the 2% who said that they don't know what they think of Trump are. I wanna meet those people. If you find them, please send them my way. Um, but if you look at the combined footprint, something interesting happens. Again, Ron DeSantis and Trump have basically the same combined footprint. Suddenly you see Tim Scott at 53%. He's somebody we haven't talked about. We've talked about how debates tend to be all centered around Trump and people positioning with Trump. Tim Scott's like way out there, like planet Pluto or not planet Pluto, whatever we're calling it these days. Totally different wavelength, totally different thing he's doing, not even in the same ballpark as the rest of the Republican field. He's like the optimistic, happy guy who thinks America's awesome. By the way, I totally agree with him and he would be my preferred candidate. Um, when the rest of the party is basically caught up in a bunch of rage and spleen and bile and venting, right? But you also have a situation in Iowa where you obviously have like a lot of evangelicals and he is one and he knows how to talk to those people. And so I think that 53% number is kind of interesting. Um, as well as the fact that Ron DeSantis and Trump, and that's the pre-debate poll, bear in mind this was pre-debate. They actually have a lot of parity when you look at those numbers. Um, POS poll, which uh, I guess we'll find out at some point whether the acronym is accurate or not, um, that was done after the debate. I think this is also interesting to note because again, you see the same favorability numbers, but a much bleaker picture for Donald Trump. We have seen before that when Donald Trump fails to debate, it hurts him. I don't know why his people can't convince him to get on the debate stage, given that we've seen this many times before, but you know, Trump's Trump. I don't work for him, not my problem. Um, the debate seems to have helped DeSantis, at least in that poll, by about seven points. And it seems to have driven Trump's floor down a bit. Uh, that's notable, because there are a lot of people who are potentially up for grabs. And the way that you're going to do delegate al uh, allocation, um, yes, Trump has taken over a ton of state parties. The rules are going to be massively more favorable to him than what you were looking at in 2016, clearly. But that does still mean that there's wiggle room here that may not be showing up in a lot of the top lines that people are looking at. Um, I would also 
offer one note of caution on that poll. The poll actually, the people who wrote the memo actually misreported their own number about Nikki Haley. They said she went down. She actually also went up. Um, and then with Nikki Haley, I would just transition to talking a little bit about New Hampshire. Um, you know, Donald Trump's always had a really, really strong hold on New Hampshire. And personally, my theory as to why, having spent a lot of time up there um, and particularly having been up there in 2015, he was the only guy who was really talking about the opioid crisis, which hit the state really hard. Everybody else was talking about the usual Republican crap, you know, overturn Roe versus Wade, tax cuts, great, whatever. Um, and so I do think that he has a sort of unique hold on that state. However, post-debate, Haley's numbers did move in the state. And so I think there may, again, I don't think there's a ton of wiggle room in New Hampshire. I think if something different that isn't going to be just, let's just give it all to Trump straight out of the gate is going to happen, I think it's probably going to be in Iowa and it's probably going to be DeSantis. But those are a couple of the caveats that I would offer. Um, I think that, yeah, right now the race looks extremely locked down. And part of the reason it does, as you correctly pointed out, people forget how much name ID really does matter in these contests. But I will just give you data point from 2016 when I was attempting to run a super PAC that really turned out to be more of a micro PAC against Donald Trump. We got to a point where I think we were even after Super Tuesday at this point, and there was polling done that showed that Donald Trump had entered the contest with 99.2% name ID, okay? Nobody else had that apart from Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. And let's be honest, probably having those names, not actually great, right? Um, by the time we got to the point that that question was being asked, still about 50% of Republican primary voters didn't know who the hell Marco Rubio was. And Rubio expected that he might be able to win the race. Wow, right? So I think this is one of the challenges um, that these candidates really do have to deal with. You can, or, you can out organize Trump in the Iowa caucuses. Ted Cruz did it. We've seen plenty of times that candidates who are not in a great position polling wise out organize in the Iowa caucuses. You saw Rick Santorum do it in 2012. And then what's really interesting is if you actually go and pull up the New York Times page about delegate allocation in 2012, oh, wow, magically Rick Santorum doesn't have any delegates show. Why is that? Because they weren't actually tied to a candidate. And before they went to the convention, Ron Paul, again, out-organized everybody and grabbed a bunch of those delegates over to his side to create problems for Mitt Romney, right? You can do all of that stuff. I think the biggest thing that makes me skeptical about anybody's ability to overcome the Trump factor here is simply that name ID number. And Scott's maybe going to get a little luckier than he should because he has a last name where people might I don't know, maybe they like Rick Scott and they're like, oh, hey, Scott's running. I'll I'll go caucus for Scott, wrong Scott, whatever. But he might get a bump, you know? Um, but I think DeSantis, that's the biggest challenge he's got. He was not on the cover of National Enquirer the entire time that I was growing up. You guys, most of you, except for you guys, are too young to remember this. But literally, like the entire time during the 80s and 90s, I mean, I can't remember a time that I went to the supermarket and it wasn't like, Donald Trump shagging whoever, right? I mean, it's like impossible to even keep track of. And partly that immunized him from that sort of criticism with a lot of culturally conservative voters, but also it just helped raise the name ID sky high. Same thing with The Apprentice. You guys, again, most of you are too young, but when he was on The Apprentice, I mean, that just put him in everybody's living room for years and years and years. And I'll be honest, when I first heard that he was thinking about running for president, maybe down the road, because of the persona that he cultivated on The Apprentice, I was like, yeah, he might be really good. Of course, then I took a look at the issue positions and I was like, oh my God, he's been praising the United Kingdom, my other country's healthcare system his whole life. Like, no way, that's a non-starter. I'll throw my TV out the window, right? Um, but you know, that is the challenge fundamentally that I think a lot of these other candidates are having to deal with. Ron DeSantis has pretty good name ID for a governor of Florida, but he doesn't have that. And if he doesn't have that, he's going to have to really out-organize the guy on the ground. And maybe he can do it, and maybe he can't. We'll see. He does have Ted Cruz's team. A lot of people have knocked him for that. On the other hand, those people have out-organized Donald Trump and Iowa before. So we'll see. Thanks, Liz. Josh Putnam, on to you. Well, first, I want to say thanks for having me here. Um, 
Dr. Burden, um, Election Research Center. Um, you never end with the rules guy, I've learned, um, and especially after three great panelists before me. Um, that was great. I'll see if I can run the anchor leg here. Um, yes, yeah, so I was I was telling uh, Dr. Burden before that I had kind of a weird travel issue um, coming up here. It was just maybe north of planes, trains, and automobiles sort of, of trip, but um, you know, I told him that, um, you know, um, I'm gonna go with the flow sort of guy. I went with the flow, it was fine. Um, main thing that I was worried about was maybe missing the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee meeting today because I'd really blocked off early part of the day for that today so I could come into that, this after that. Um, so I was billed as a, a presidential nominations expert. I may be that, I don't know. Um, I'm definitely a proud rules nerd. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, what's changed uh, for 2024 versus um, 2020 and some previous cycles as well. Um, and actually, part of the reason that I, I, I insert that bit about the, the Rules and Bylaws Committee for the Democrats today is, is that the decisions that they've made have had an impact on, on what Republicans have done this go around. Um, Democrats decided to change their calendar. To push Iowa completely out of the mix, to um, uh, reshuffle uh, New Hampshire to some extent within that that early window as well. Um, today's meeting was kind of a nothing burger, but um, we didn't get answers on Iowa and New Hampshire, and I can maybe follow up on that in the Q and A if we want to do that. But um, that decision had an impact on how the Republican calendar for 2024 is is shaping up. Um, two weeks doesn't sound like a long time, right? The way that they, the, both parties kind of engineered things, they wanted the, the process to start in February, and they made, mainly pulled that off the last two cycles. Um, but the Democrats' decision to put South Carolina at the beginning of February has had the uh, effect of pushing Iowa, Republicans' caucuses to uh, January 15th, and then New Hampshire's probably going to be eight days later on the 23rd. We'll, we'll see. But that that has an impact. Right, because that, that takes us back to kind of what things were like in 2012 when there was chaos with a few states that jumped the, the, um, the gun, broke the rules, and went rogue and had a similar effect. And it kind of carved out this area in February where you had some contests, but they were like what Liz was talking about a little bit ago. They were non binding caucuses. Somebody won, they didn't get any delegates out of it though. Um, so we've got that at the beginning of the calendar where you've got Iowa, New Hampshire, and then a couple of weeks or a few weeks, and then Nevada's caucuses on, on February 8th, and then South Carolina all the way at the end of the month, right before Super Tuesday. So you've got this kind of elongated beginning that's similar to 2012. And what that does is kind of deprive other candidates of, of something to hang their hat on. Hey, I won something. Um, instead, they have to spend their time saying, give me a little bit more money so we can make it to Super Tuesday. Um Instead, so I mean, again, that's likely to have some impact on how the field of candidates wins over the course of January and into February, and and certainly by the time we get to, to Super Tuesday, folks like Ron DeSantis, who I think we all agree is is fairly well positioned, might be able to benefit from that, um, even if it is kind of fantasy. This notion of consolidating support behind one non-Trump. Um, the other bit on the calendar that I'd mention is that. Um, the Passover holiday will have had an effect on, on what the calendar looks like. We've had over the last couple of cycles, this mid-Atlantic, northeastern kind of regional primary that's gone on. So New York and Pennsylvania and Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island, that were all in conflict with Passover. And their legislators, in most cases, Connecticut should probably follow suit soonish if they call a special session later this month. But that's most of them, with the exception of Maryland, which has moved back to May, all of them have moved up to April 2nd in most cases, same day as the Wisconsin primary. Um, and what that's created is you've got on the front end this elongated start, and then bang, everything happens in March. More than 80% of the delegates will have been allocated. And that's 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 a huge byproduct of all of this. That has an impact on how this race is likely to be decided. I'm not going to say that it's you know going to be over then on April second. It's if 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 it's a normal cycle, um, 
it'll probably be over much earlier than that. Um, but as we've noted in a couple of uh, folks' comments here, um, there are some abnormalities that are associated with the cycle as well. Um, so that's that's kind of where the calendar stands. With respect to the allocation rules, the 2024 story is really a, a, a story of 2020. The Trump campaign um, in, in the 2020, uh, 2020 cycle, so 2019, they spent a lot of time talking with state parties about what the rules were going to be. And they did a really good job of establishing a really front-runner friendly, or in that case, incumbent friendly, set of allocation rules, right? So you had, even though before March 15th, all states are supposed to allocate their delegates proportionally. A lot of them had these winner-take-all triggers where if somebody won a majority statewide, they got all of the delegates. A lot of those are still in place. The other bit was to even qualify for delegates in a lot of these states. The RNC allows it to go as high as 20% of the vote, and most states move their qualifying thresholds up to 20%. So the whole story heading into 2023 was really one of, eh, how much are we going to see a departure from what Trump established in 2020, right? That baseline. How much are they going to be playing defense, right? And they've done really well at uh, defending what they established in 2020. I was talking to a reporter uh, from the LA Times last week, and, and she was like, so give me a handle on, on what changes. And my first answer was, we don't know yet. Not settled until October 1st, maybe. But the, the thing that I could tell her was, look, the big change so far is Montana. All the way up back in June, they had a winner-take-all primary last time around. What have they done? Got rid of the winner-take-all and have a 5% qualifying threshold. So it's going from one end of the spectrum about as far as you can go to the other end of the spectrum. But it's Montana. 40 delegates, 35 delegates, eh especially if it's 5% is a qualifying threshold. Again, it's a June primary, so it's liable to be over by then. But that's that's the big change. Other than that, you've got some weird subtleties, right? If you've been reading the news about this stuff, and I'll forgive you if you haven't been. I'm the one that does that and tries to, tries to make it less like stereo instructions for everyone else. But California... <laughs> California made a change recently, right? There's a big hubbub about whether or not they would keep that winner-take-all uh, trigger that they had, right? So, I mean, Trump campaign, when they passed the, 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 the regulations or the, the rules, celebrated, right? We've got this 50% threshold in place. As long as we break 50%, and they're pretty much there in the polls, they're at to change. But um, that's 169 delegates. That's the biggest delegate haul from any one state out there, even though it's a, a blue state and, and a Republican primary. Um, but if he pulls in California on Super Tuesday, that's a pretty big feather in his cap. Um, Massachusetts did something similar. But again, what happened in both those cases was while they kept the, the winner-take-all threshold, they lowered their qualifying threshold. So it's giving some incentive for candidates to participate in those states um, in an effort to keep Trump below 50%. Um, it's expensive in California, and they probably better serve by just winning Iowa, say. Um, but again, that's part of, of the calculus that's going on um, at the state level. But what we have, and again, it's not finalized. It won't be till the end of the month. But it's a very front-runner friendly set of rules, right? So the sum total of this is you've got, okay, fine. You've got a lengthy buildup in the calendar, semi-lengthy anyway. And then bang, all those delegates that are going to be allocated before the beginning of April. And you combine that with allocation rules that potentially could give a lot of delegates to a winner. And you've got a recipe for somebody wrapping this up pretty quickly if they're able to pull in the votes. Polls are not votes, as we all know, um, so things can change. Um, so, yeah, you know, the question I always get on this stuff, and I appreciate Liz for making the case that it matters. Totally matters. <laughs> I wish I understood it better. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm fighting a lot of battles on this stuff occasionally when they get it wrong, but I, I shouldn't be so sensitive about it all. But I mean, the, the question is, does it all matter, right? And and certainly, if you combine what I just talked about with, you know, a, a super March-loaded calendar, I know I'm veering from the front-loading sort of, of designation, but this is a very March-loaded calendar this time around. 
and all those delegates being allocated there. And you combine it with all those potentially winner take all rules, combine it with the polls, and that's a recipe for, again, someone wrapping it up pretty quickly. And maybe it is. But if it isn't, right, if, if some of this abnormality that we've seen, if some of the uncertainty that's involved in all of this um, gives way to votes that seem to indicate that the polling strength that we see from Trump now is maybe not as strong as we thought it was, still strong, mind you, strong enough to do quite well in the primaries, then, then what's the goal for the folks that are non-Trumps in this, right? Yes, DeSantis is well-positioned. Um, there's some upside for some other candidates, including Scott and Haley. Um, but the alternative probably isn't an outright win as I see it, right? They're coming from way too far back. So what do you do? You raise a lot of money, you spend a lot of money. But I, the thing that I keep coming back to in all of this, and I've got something I'm working on that seems like I've been working on it for a decade too, right? But with this set of rules, that 50% thing matters, Right. The goal of the candidates individually and collectively is at some point likely to become, right? But potentially becomes, how do we keep Trump under 50%? And that's another parallel to 2012, right? I did this thing right after, it must have been in February. And it was Rick Santorum can't get to, I guess the number of magic number was 1144 that cycle. It was, I may have done it in all caps. I don't know. I do that sometimes for, for effect as people fall asleep during the rules discussions. But um, I, you know, over the course of, of the next week or month or whatever, in response to that, people were very quick to say, okay, fine, Rick Santorum can't get there, but can Mitt Romney? And that may be the question that we're asking ourselves as we get into 2024. You know, it's not maybe that. DeSantis can win outright during primary season. It's that DeSantis and others are able to keep Trump under 50%. I'm not going to say contested convention. I'm not going to go there. I'm not, not, not going to go there because the odds are super good that we're going to get the rematch that everybody's been talking about here between Biden and, and Trump. But that's something to think about as we get into 2024 is this notion of, of keeping Trump. And there are incentives to keep people into the race, right? Um, I talked about delegate incentives to some degree in some of these states with respect to the rules, but the uncertainty is enough to keep folks in the race too. That's gonna be something that they can turn to donors and others to make the case. You know what? I'm gonna stay in the race and it's not this fantasy Trump is gonna implode or whatever sort of thing. This is, we need to stay in because yes, that, but we can keep him there. And if we can get to the convention and things are crazy, maybe it doesn't happen. But I don't think that's going to happen. I would just make one addendum to the to Josh's point, which is Trump's the first federal trial that's scheduled at this moment starts the Monday before Super Tuesday right. for Trump. And, North Dakota Caucus Day. And, and, North, and jury selection alone is expected to take a couple of weeks, let alone the process of a trial and before any sort yeah. of resolution is taken. And so... Uh, you can expect, you should expect that, you know, a vast, uh, the preponderance, perhaps two thirds or three quarters of all the Republican delegates will have been allocated before there is a verdict in the first of four Trump, oh, for sure. Trump trials for sure. come on board next year. Was that your can story I, in the New York Times? Yeah, we, we wrote a story about that. I, can, everything feels like it was years ago but i think it was just two or three weeks ago yep, but, yeah. yep. can i add two points also that that calls to mind um it's worth people going back and looking to the point that josh was making um again i'm not going to say contested convention it's like probably everybody up here is a wet dream but or you know female equivalent whatever but um if you go back and you look at 2016 as somebody who is working with like the mike lees and the ken cuccinelli's and the other people who are trying to shut trump down it's actually a lot that his people had to do to ram his 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 nomination through that convention. They actually had to work for it and they had to do some pretty, pretty dodgy. And like if you go back and you watch the footage, you're like, wow, how exactly did that congressman say that these guys won that voice vote, given what I actually heard coming through the speakers of my TV? Right. Um, so. Good. It is, it is, but, it, but it is, a, it is an interesting point, right? And I think particularly when you layer upon it, yeah, the point about the trial calendar 
how many rallies is Donald Trump going to be doing? Probably not as many as he was doing heading into 2016 or 2020, because he's probably going to be stuck in a room with his lawyers a hell of a lot more, even if he doesn't have like a coronary from all of this, which I think most of us probably would if we were facing, you know, indictments in four different cases, but whatever. Um, the other point I would make is we talk about money. I am not a big believer that money actually buys you wins in elections, but to the extent that it is useful, it can be very useful in doing things like organizing people to go into caucuses and making sure that in Indi individual Iowa counties, caucuses go the way you want them to. Everybody talks about how Trump is raising so much money off these indictments. He raised, what, $71 million when he published when the mugshot came out? I would be willing to bet that 7.05, uh, or sorry, no, what am I saying? Out of 71 million, that 70.5 of that is going to go straight into his lawyer's pocket. So the amount that he's raising may be completely immaterial here. I think the name ID stuff remains very important. But if you're looking at where somebody like Ron DeSantis, who's sitting on this massive pile of cash, might be able to use that to edge him out, that's probably what you're looking at, or at least that's what I'm looking at. All right, this is great. I, I, again, so we're gonna start collecting questions. If you've got index cards in the room, Jess will pick those up and bring them forward. If you're online, I see good questions coming in on the Q&A already. Um, I wanna to return to something that Josh said about the goals of the candidates who are not Trump. Um, you know, there's a suggestion that several of them are running for vice president or a cabinet or a future run in a post-Trump world, kind of establishing their credibility. But we didn't see a lot of the also rans from 2016 come back. There's no Ted Cruz, no Scott Walker, no Marco Rubio. And you would have expected those guys in a normal cycle to come back and build on their strength before the way Romney and McCain and others had done. So I wonder if anybody has a sense of, aside from Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson, what, what the goals of the candidates are and what they want to do, say, in the next debate to try to move in that direction? I mean, it depends on whether you think their goal is winning or something else, right? Like Vivek Ramaswamy, no one in America had heard of six months ago, and now he's fairly well known, at least in political circles. Um, you know, Ron DeSantis, his goal was to win, and it's not going great. Um, you know, they're... I don't think that anybody, any sort of elite level politician, people like Nikki Haley or Tim Scott get into this race thinking anything other than winning, but uh, they do understand that there are benefits to be had to comporting yourself admirably uh, in one of these campaigns. And whether that is uh, getting, put, getting put on the ticket, whether it's a cabinet position, uh, whether it's a television show, uh, there are an array of different options for somebody who can prove themselves to be a, a credible presidential candidate. Um, I think the reason that, like you said, in 2016, that didn't really happen was because they all got put through the wood chipper by Trump. Uh, and that may be part of the reason why uh, everybody except Chris Christie and Asa, Asa Hutchinson, who you need a magnifying glass to find their polling results, are... Uh, not doing that this cycle because they're protecting both their political and professional futures. Julia, you look like you wanted to weigh in on this. I, I do. Can you just pull the mic? Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So I'm not sure how much I have to say that's different. I do think, especially for the professional politicians, they are thinking that there's some probability they'll win. I do think we might be a little bit undercounting the possibility of sort of 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 chaos moving into the RNC, specifically around Trump and the trials, and if things are not looking good for him legally, what might what might be happening there? So I think one of the things that sort of seemed evident to me last spring is that every time Trump got kind of in more trouble, that we saw more people jump in the race, thus making it less likely any one of them would actually beat mm. Trump. But I do think that was kind of a that was kind of a, a dynamic. I also, I guess I wanted to say, I think 2016 was really distinct because in that situation, all of those candidates came in wanting to position themselves against Barack Obama. And I think they all got swallowed up by the ambiguity of it, of either you, either you position yourself like Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and try to really embody the 2013 Republican autopsy and say, hey, we're going to, we're going to embrace these different groups, or you sort of lean into 
the politics of of racial backlash and I think that was really difficult. I think it's less difficult in some ways for Republican candidates to position themselves vis-a-vis Trump. But I do think this sort of goes back to something that Liz said and that I should have said as I was thinking about these two pieces of, um, anyone, other people have my ideas. Um, that, that's no, how I felt when you were talking. When you said 2008, I was like, I, I remember that. I remember right. being one of the six employees at the RNC that was like, why don't we have a fucking opposition research file on Barack Obama? I mean- <laughs> Yeah, seriously. I don't even yeah. Um, okay, what was I talking about? Um, so the right. So the thing with Trump, right? There's two pieces to this Trump puzzle. I think on the one hand, name name recognition is so important. But the other thing that Trump had and that a lot of other candidates are trying to have and it's very difficult to have when you're an actual politician is ambiguity about where you stand on the issues. So Trump had the sweetest of sweet spots. I am a little younger than Liz. I'm 43. I've never not known who Donald Trump was. I remember my parents talking about his hair when I was like eight. Um, But also because he wasn't a politician, he could be ambiguous about almost every issue. And that's really beneficial. And somehow he's managed to maintain a lot of that despite having held office. Um, I think that's really critical. And I think that's kind of something some of these other candidates are trying to do is sort of test whether they can forge a presidential future of kind of being ambiguous enough to to pull in different elements of the party and different elements of the general election electorate um, with within the, the context of this. I had something else to say, but I forgot. So it's just as well if I stop talking. I will pivot off your ambiguity point and say, I think that's one, I do think that's an interesting point. And I agree with that as somebody who takes very uh, pretty hardline right libertarian policy stance is one of the major problems that I've always had with Donald Trump. Um, I think it's one reason why Nikki Haley might be additionally interesting. Um, she doesn't have to, she will talk about the policy, particularly she'll hit on things like spending, which ties in nicely with inflation, which I have a sneaking suspicion we're still going to be talking about for many, many months going forward. But principally, what Nikki Haley has to do is just keep talking about old people. I'm sorry to everybody who's over the age of 60 in the room, but there is a wide consensus, I think, generally in this country at the moment that, dude, we cannot have people over the age of 70 in that office. We just cannot. Or in every... Oh, in any, just about any office. Yeah, Mitch McConnell, yeah, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer are going to do their part to ram it home too, right? Um, Kevin McCarthy and Kim Jeffries are going to come out of this looking awesome. Um, but really, there's a lot of mileage that I think she potentially could get out of that, because every time you see, Bi- at least every time I see Biden on TV, and I'm like the closet Republican Biden fan, I'm the person in 2008 who was like, I love that he picked Joe Biden as VP, because now I get to read clips about ice cream all day long, right? Um, but every time I see him, I'm like, I, I, he is like, I, he could be like two days away from keeling over. I have no idea, right? Genuinely have no idea. And when I see Trump, you know, right now, I think people are forgetting that Trump is pretty much in the same place. He's just, we haven't been seeing as much of him. So people remember, oh yeah, no, I remember the ramp thing. That wasn't good. That was like, what, three years ago now? If he was like incapable of navigating a ramp now, what do you think it's like now? He's been uh, he's been piling up like triple meatloafs at the Mar-a-Lago buffet. Nothing good can possibly be happening there, right? So I suspect there's probably quite a lot of mileage that Nikki Haley can get out of this. And she may be able to dodge a lot of bullets on talking policy. Um, She's done a pretty good job. I I agree generally with the proposition that for a party whose base is generally very conservative, we kind of like nominating like squishy rhino people. We do, right? I mean, George W. Bush was all compassionate, conservative, spend lots of money, be nice to poor people, whatever. He, he He was very squishy, right? John McCain, I love him. Totally squishy, though, right? Mitt Romney, I mean, so unbelievably squishy. And Donald Trump, everybody thinks of him as a massive right winger because of where he is on everything that concerns anybody or anything that might be foreign. But when it comes to anything domestic, he's pretty squishy, too, right? Well, Nikki Haley, I mean, if we're having these questions, these uncomfortable questions come up in debates about abortion, I'm going to be honest. There are a lot of Republicans that are going to look at that and think, wow, Nikki Haley's probably the only one that can pass muster with like suburban voters who have left the party. I think the only issue with that is 
is that amongst the Republican primary electorate, I think the majority of them actually don't give a crap about winning this election, not at all. They just care about nominating somebody who is sort of an avatar for their venting and their anger and the bile and all of this. So that's where she could run into problems even with that approach, plus the name ID. So back in the 2016 contest, when we had all those Republicans in the field, there was a running series in 538 that described the GOP as a five ring circus, not in a derogatory way, just that there were five elements of the party and the party was trying to find where in that Venn diagram a candidate could be found. Uh, at the time, the five rings were libertarian, Tea Party, moderate, establishment, which is something else, and Christian conservative. And there was sort of nobody pulling those together. But it sounds like from Julia's comments that the party has sort of collapsed to uh, something less than that. There's Trump and a couple of axes off of that. Those, those five rings were interesting because it allowed for Iowa to play a different role than New Hampshire with caucus rules rather than open primary rules. But does none of that stuff have all those wings of the party, the foreign policy hawks, the evangelicals sort of collapsed to be either entirely Trump or only slightly Trump? Or is there still are there still some moving parts there that might emerge in these early states or in debates in the next debate? Is there something a candidate could do to take advantage of that? My first instinct on that is that I don't think that the I don't think the three Trump rings are definitive. I think my piece came out right about the same time that the, I had a piece on, on kind of the post-Trump GOP. And I don't think see them as competitive. They're just sort of different ways of thinking about it. Um, something that a kind of paradox that seems to emerge out of those five rings and out of what we see from Republican nominating contests is that on the one hand, there is this sort of discourse that the moder moderates and establishment wing are sort of falling falling out, right? That this is falling out of um, importance in, in GOP politics. But at the same time, like I do think this sort of ambiguity piece and this sort of piece of Republicans running away, specifically away from some of these off-median positions on abortion, um, is also there. So I think these are, I think there's a couple different dynamics. I think it probably depends on whether you're looking at voters in the mass electorate versus elites. So I think, I think it's complicated. I think, I don't know, more frameworks are more, more better. Um, that's how I would think about that. Others on the, on the wings or factions within the Republican party, are, do they still exist? I mean, a lot the a lot of them are just Democrats now, frankly. Um, I mean, the the Cindy McCain is in the in the uh, Biden administration. Jeff Flake is in the Biden administration. Um, I mean, Mitt Romney's sons have left the Republican. Mitt Romney, party. yeah. Um, you know, Mitt Romney may be your next ambassador to France in a second Biden term. Uh, that that's not that's purely <laughs> speculation, not actual reporting. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think that Trump has, you know, it's not an overstatement to say that Trump has gobbled up the Republican Party and that there are people who have sort of pieces on the on the fringes. Um, part of the challenge for DeSantis is trying to get to the left and right of Trump in the party at the same time. Uh, and that's it's very challenging. Like Ted Cruz beat him in Iowa by going to the right. Um, but there's not enough room there for DeSantis to win even just in Iowa by going to the right. He has to get people who are on the left of Trump in the party too. And sending a message, sending messages to those divergent groups simultaneously without alienating one or the other is, is very challenging. I would agree with that, but as somebody who will not be voting for Trump in the all important Connecticut primary, um, as much as Ron DeSantis pisses me off. Uh, I say this having worked for Rick Perry, um, who did not run a good campaign. I mean, I think Ron DeSantis screws up daily, probably about three times as much as Rick Perry ever did, which is quite a phenomenal achievement. Um, I still, as the sort of never Trump faction that hasn't left the party, Ron DeSantis is going to have to do a whole lot more to put me in a position where I'm not ticking the box for him, assuming it is between him and Trump when it gets to my state, right? So I do think that's mathematically possible. Um, but, you know, I don't know. We'll see what he's done. Well, you know, we'll check Twitter when we leave here and see what he's done while we've been in here and see if we've, you know, knocked another 0.2% off of the chances of that. Um, 
I do think that's possible. Um, as to the sort of five rings, I mean, I think, I think it probably was much more fractured than that, even going into 2012. Um, I think, yeah, Reed's right. A lot of people who would have been moderates are just gone, totally gone, totally paid up, totally voting for Biden. It's interesting because that suggests also that there are a bunch of independents who like aren't because of the the closeness of the polling, right? Even though those people also say, independents also say that the mere fact of Trump getting indicted means that they can never vote for him. I want to know which of those sets of polling is actually right because something's not right there. Um, there is precious little anywhere in the Republican Party for a libertarian like me at the moment. Um, a lot of the reason that those of us who remain remain is purely out of spite and as a grudge because we were here first and we will be here last. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot left there. And I think, frankly, for like a lot of the people who are genuinely social conservatives, like you look at the that Mike Pence debate performance, man, if Mike Pence were running in like 2003, he totally could have won like you know emperorship of the holy roman empire i mean he's that guy but i i don't know who's in the party who's voting for that now i really question you know for a long time the fact that we didn't get roe versus wade overturned meant that you could leverage abortion as an issue and you could just talk about that and unite a lot of people who had actually quite divergent positions on the abortion issue itself Sometimes it sucks when you actually win the policy issue, right? You know, like I, I think there's this bit in the West Wing, um, which again, like three people in this room will remember, but go find it. Uh, Democratic political consultant Bruno Gianelli is having an argument with Deputy White House Chief of Staff Josh Lyman about getting funding for uh, basically pursuing a tobacco lawsuit. And Bruno Gianelli is making the point that you don't want the policy when you want the issue. And I think the Republican Party like we got the policy win and now we've got a ton of people out there who were highly motivated by overturning Roe versus Wade who are just politically pretty checked out. So I don't know how all of that figures together. Um, but I do think that DeSantis has got a lot of rope when it comes to anybody who's still in the party that considers themselves to not be a Trumper. And it does appear to me from looking at Trump's numbers that a decent number of people who are currently in his column are willing to shop around. So we'll see. But I think right now, I you know, for a while, I've thought it's not a five ring circus. It's probably more like a 12 ring circus. Now I don't even know what it is, like 21 ring circus. And then there's like Tim Scott. He's like doing some high wire act up there that's like super admirable. And maybe a couple people will notice. And if they do, it could really take off. But wow, is that like far out and hard to understand? Uh, it's on Tim Scott's uh, acrobatic acts. We're going to have to stop here. This, we've got more questions than we can handle. But I encourage everybody who's in the room to hang around. We're going to have refreshments outside. You can ask the panelists questions directly. Uh, but let's thank our group for being here. Thank you all. And with that, we're concluded. So I hope yourselves to refreshments just outside the door here. <laughs>